Next, I'd like to invite up Bob Nicholson from OTEC International. Uh, he's one of the world's leading experts on ocean thermoelectric conversion, which you've just heard a little bit about the benefits of, and Bob will expound in more detail. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Good morning. It's a real honor to be following the professor from Hawaii. For him to refer to me as an expert is just uh, very uh, wonderful, and I thank you. Smile. But, I <laughs> <laughs> but we've been working together for decades, and, and this is a dream that I'm pursuing. And my mother used to refer to me as a modern-day pioneer, and after decades of chasing my dream, if you ask my wife, she'll tell you I'm just a fool. But I'm going to continue my dream. And we're really getting close. So what I want to do is follow what Pat has suggested and others, and that is hopefully all of you can become OTEC enthusiasts, as we OTEC enthusiasts become seasetting enthusiasts. So I think bringing us all together, we can really be successful in rather short term. So what I want to try to do is explain what we're doing with OTEC, who we are, where we're going, and then also hopefully see if we can't work together and, and really go off in a much faster pace. I'm going to, in my own words, to be efficient with time, explain that the ocean is the largest solar collector in the world. And you've heard earlier today that storage of power energy is very critical. Well, we have 300 times the amount of energy in the tropical ocean that the world now consumes. And it's replaced every day. So the challenge is, is to design a system that can harness or convert that solar energy into electricity. And that's really what we've done. And I really have to give credit to a pioneer, a real pioneer, who started in 1962, a genius by the name of James Hilbert Anderson of York, Pennsylvania. He had over 100 patents and he spent a lifetime designing turbo machinery and refrigeration systems. And that's what OTEC is. It's a low temperature reverse refrigeration cycle. And so the competition that followed us, which was the US Department of Energy in the 70s, we started in 1962, they actually designed an OTEC plant as if it were a high temperature power plant. And so what happened is they came up with a 100 megawatt power plant that weighed 200,000 tons. It would not generate enough revenue to ever pay for itself. The, the genius that developed our technology, our design, designed a 100 megawatt plant that weighs 25,000 tons. It's eight times smaller or eight times cheaper. And it would generate a profit with the installation of the first plant. So that whole DOE OTEC effort has really put us back and, and uh, now independently we've got our own financing. I licensed the technology to the Able Foundation and the Able Foundation owns the technology. We're in the marketplace offering to sell electricity cheaper than the host client can generate it by importing oil. Our biggest focus and concentration is Hawaii. I've been working with Pat who's been helping us a great deal in Hawaii but we've uh, been selected by the state of Hawaii to build a one megawatt demonstration plant on the site that Pat mentioned, uh, Nelha, and uh, that's underway now. And at the same time, we've, we're in final negotiations with the Hawaiian Electric Company to install a 100 megawatt plant four and a half miles off of Oahu. And at the moment, we're at 19 cents a kilowatt hour. And that's from the first plant. The first plants are always more expensive. So when you get the economies of scale, I'm convinced that in time we'll be under 10 cents and it's baseload power. That's another thing that's very important. Some of these other renewable energies are intermittent. I'm convinced that we need them all, but I wanted to explain some of the differences and advantages that OTEC has. So um, I think that uh, everyone probably knows how it works, but basically it works just like a steam cycle. Um, we have a working fluid, which is ammonia, that's 500 tons of ammonia, liquid ammonia, in the system. And what we do is pump solar heated surface water through a series of evaporators, heat exchangers, and transfer heat from the water 
to the working fluid ammonia and cause it to rise above its boiling point. And that requires, six, that requires 80 degrees surface water under pressure and uh, 67 degrees F is sufficient to convert that liquid ammonia to a vapor, which then drives a wheel, which is called a vapor turbine. The vapor turbine drives a generator. We generate electricity and then we pump cold water from the bottom of the ocean, which is 40 degrees F, and condense that vapor back into its liquid state and we do this 24 hours a day. And this is the uh, configuration of the platform. It looks like a wine bottle. It's as high as the George Washington Monument, and it is 440 feet in depth and 140 feet in diameter. The hotel accommodations and control room and, and, and workspace is on top. And at the neck, just below the neck, is the inlet screen. That's a, we should have a uh, diagram showing the, the uh, surface, but that's where it is. And then we have a cold water pipe that goes down 3,000 feet and is bringing up the cold bottom water. It's moored in deep water. We have to be in 3,000 feet or more water, uh, depth of water. And this is Hilbert Anderson, who I described earlier. And what makes us different is that typically a conventional power plant would have a heat exchanger that was 60 feet long and transfer heat to drive one turbine. Anderson divided it into four sections and is driving four different turbines. So he's getting much more power, many more BTUs out of the uh, transfer of, of uh, energy. And then also in the power industry, for 150 years, they've been using smooth tubes in the refrigeration industry where Anderson came from. We use enhanced surfaces, and so we greatly increase the ability to transfer heat. We're using multiple turbines. The previous designs by DOE, they had one turbine, which was 100 megawatts. We have multiple turbines, so again, you get more efficiency. And so consequently, the design by the U.S. Department of Energy weighed 200,000 tons for a 100 megawatt power plant. The cold water pipe was 50 feet in diameter, made of concrete, weighed 18,000 tons. Ours is 25,000 tons for a 100 megawatt plant. We're optimizing the cycle so that we're pumping less cold water than warm water because we had to go way down deep. That takes more energy to, to pump up. So we've optimized the cycle where we're only pumping a third of the cold water. And our cold water pipe is made out of composite material. And instead of weighing 18,000 tons, it weighs 500 tons, and it's almost half the size. We have uh, put together a whole team. Uh, I won't, it's not necessary to go through that, I don't believe. Uh, but with Hawaii, um, we're supposed to sign the contract for the power purchase agreement, the power purchase agreement for the 100 megawatt plant in uh, July. We're in nine other countries. We are in the final negotiations with the Cayman Islands for a 25 megawatt plant. There's literally thousands of these plants to be built just for the production of uh, electricity. So it's a tremendous opportunity. And um, I want to go into uh, seasteading because I think that the two concepts of OTEC and seasteading are just perfect combination. Um, all floating cities are going to need fresh water and they're going to need electricity. And if you put this in the equatorial zone, you, you have both. And it is something that can really lower the cost and make seasteading extremely attractive. And really what I see as a starting point for seasteading is the fact that we're developing a means to produce jet fuel from seawater. In addition to Pat's effort on algae, we're developing a means to capture carbon dioxide from the ocean. And then the um, scientists have designed a fischer tropsch reactor that can handle the blending of combining of carbon dioxide with hydrogen in a 100 megawatt power plant can produce 100,000 gallons of jet fuel per day using seawater as the feedstock and solar energy as the energizer. So it's a cleaner burning jet fuel, it's lower cost, and so if you have several hundred of these power plants floating in the equatorial zone, 
producing jet fuel, then you could have floating cities that would house workers and, and, and professionals that would be operating all these vessels. So again, I think the most important thing is, is for you all to become OTEC enthusiasts and for us to really work together. And, and if we could team up with Pat's organization, I think we could really expedite success very quickly. So I know it's also getting close to lunchtime and everybody's heard enough talking, so I'm going to cut it right there. If anyone has any questions, I'd be glad to ask them or talk to you later. The, the other thing is, I should have retired 10 years ago, and so I can't hear well. So I might need some help with it. we got five minutes for questions. If you're going to ask a question, please try to grab a microphone. We'll give Jeff the first shot. Uh, one of the things that uh, Neil brought up, I think, was... Um, one of the places, one of the major carbon sinks in the world is deep ocean water, and there's some concern about taking the deep water, bringing it back to the surface, and, and increasing the levels of that acidity in the water. Um, what's your position on, on that? I guess. Well, if we're not question. producing jet fuel, which we could use the carbon dioxide to do, then we could just simply put it back in the ocean. Would the would the uh, carbon for the jet fuel come from the deep ocean water? Not so much. It mostly comes from the deep the surface water. There's more surface water that we're handling. Um, Pat alluded to the problem with the cold water effluent plume cascading below the photic zone, so you lose the nutrients. It sounds to me like you've, you've changed the ratio of cold to warm water uh, to optimize, to, to minimize the amount you have to pump up. Does that also mean that that cold water gets warmer and is more likely to stay at the surface? Does that change that whole dynamic? No. It, that has no influence on it whatsoever. But I really wanted to ask Pat a question because the cold water... The cold water will sink because it's heavier. But if it's a constant flow, won't it still provide a benefit? If you mix it with the warm water, you have a shot. Okay. It's part of it, but that might not be enough. If you mix it with the warm water, it might work, but my gut, gut feeling is that you need to do something else. We, had, we ran a, a simulation. We had Mackay Engineering run a simulation for us, which some of the people in this room saw at the University of Hawaii last November. Uh, it does clearly depend on the mixing, but there is some sustaining. It doesn't necessarily sink instantly. Question over here. Um, you, you mentioned fresh water. Um, is it possible and, and uh, cost effective to include desalination with the OTEC um, device that you showed earlier? Well, the truth is we have to have some form of desalination to operate our power plant. If we didn't, we'd have marine barnacles growing on the inside and clogging up our heat exchangers. So if we're just producing electricity in a 100 megawatt plant, we will produce about 5 million gallons of fresh water per day through evaporation. And uh, that is primarily to prevent the uh, marine barnacles from growing inside the plant. What we're doing is taking 50% of the oxygen out of the water. And so the marine barnacles will go through the plant, but there's not enough, enough oxygen for them to stay there. But if we dedicate or design the plant to produce both water and power, we will we'll take 99% of the oxygen out of the water. And then we produce 100 megawatts of net power and 100, no, I'm sorry, and 32 million gallons of fresh water per day. Or we could dedicate the uh, 100 megawatt plant in the case of uh, the Persian Gulf simply to produce nothing but water at the rate of 130 million gallons a day. So couldn't you use the nice cool 50 degree water to air condition this tropical based place? Yes and no. Um, in most cases we're, we're going to be too far offshore. I mean, if I'm living on a seastead oh, in the oh, tropics, I, oh, absolutely. That's I'm going to need some air conditioning. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I so the 53 that. water could certainly be warmed. Oh, you have everything with, with the OTEC and the sea setting combined. Yes. Um, you mentioned that there was a 80 degree Fahrenheit uh, surface temperature requirement. How does that scale to colder ocean climates, um, or does it? I'm not sure I heard the question. Okay, um, you mentioned that there was an 80 degree Fahrenheit surface temperature requirement. Yes. And so it's perfect for equatorial climates. Um, how does that work or does it uh, scale in 
uh, colder ocean climates? Or ocean uh, for OTEC to work in a colder climate? It doesn't. Okay, cool. For every, okay, we're finished. <laughs> Everybody's signaling me that they're hungry. And I don't blame them, I'm hungry too. Thank you.